Welcome to our special online report on dealing with the flood of 2019. I'm 3 News Now morning anchor Maya Sines. And I'm 3 News Now morning anchor Courtney Johns. Recovering from the flood of 2019 is going to be a long process for so many people. On 3 News Now this morning, we did a series of interviews with government and community groups with advice on how to recover from the devastation of the flooding. In this special report, we have brought together all of those interviews to help you deal with this disaster. We start with how to repair your home if it was damaged. I talked to Robert Cohen Beetle from United Water Restoration Group. We have a lot of cleanup to do, a lot of demo. Um, it's pretty much, I mean, from two feet of water up to six feet of water, we're dealing with all of that. Oh, hands on deck. Mm -hmm. um, what, walk us through, what's the process to get um, a homeowner to get their home uh, clean or repaired? Uh, first of all, they pretty much right now have to have permission to get back into their house. Mm -hmm. uh, the sheriffs have been stopping us outside of some of the lake communities and telling us we have to wait, uh, you know, so it's not safe at, in certain areas right now. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the water is up to people's gutters in Bellevue, uh, so we can't go in there, but as the water recedes and then it's safe to come into the house, um, then we move in and then they kind of determine what they want to get rid of, what they can keep. I mean, some stuff is absolutely, you know, unsalvageable. But then, you know, the wife might have her wedding dress or something that she has to save or whatever. Then they go through that. And then other than that, we pretty much get rid of everything, you know, kitchen countertops, mm -hmm. everything, uh, you know, furniture, whatnot. So, yeah, because what can happen to all that standing water that kind of gets accumulated there? Uh, well, I mean, uh, the water can become grossly unsanitary and that's where we have to get rid of everything. When it's not safe for humans to be around, you know, we have to go in with all of our protective equipment mm -hmm. uh, and gear to get that all cleaned up, you know, and we are trained and certified for that reason, you know. We follow the IICRC guidelines to uh, get everything cleaned up because there is a specific standard that we have to follow. Um, and any pathogens or anything like that can be unsafe. So, you know, we don't necessarily recommend if it's that dirty for homeowners to try to tackle it themselves. They definitely need to seek professional. And if for any reason they did have to go inside, what type of protective gear or tools should they be taking? Well, um, you know, rubber boots for sure. Um, Cause then, you know, you won't be stepping around in that stuff. Any sort of gloves, we always double up on gloves. You know, we have suits, uh, masks with, you know, the, the full face respirator sometimes if it's that gross. Otherwise, you know, the homeowner can go with, you know, just a regular P90 mask that you can get at the Home Depot or Lowe's or anywhere with gloves and boots and they can kind of go through it from there. And Robert, how can a homeowner make sure that their home is mold and bacteria free? Um, well, the mold and bacteria, um, a lot of it is once everything gets dried out with proper dehumidification and air movement, um, then they can go in and, and, and be comfortable with it being, you know, bacteria free. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we treat it with an antimicrobial, then that will prevent any sort of mold growth in the future. Um, but they, if they want to seek like an industrial hygienist to come in and do an air quality test or, a, you know, a surface sample test when we're all finished, uh, then they can go that route as well to get that stamp of approval on it at the end. But it's something that definitely a professional should, should address for many Correct. of these areas. Yeah. One of the toughest things people have to cope with when so much is lost is the emotional toll and stress caused by the destruction. So I talked to a local psychologist about advice for keeping your mental balance while dealing with the aftermath of floods. The floods hit our area. Many of us lost more than our homes. We lost our peace of mind. Natural disasters pay a huge toll on survivors and moving on from what happened can be really hard. So joining us now this morning, morning to, talk to talk about, about the, the psychology, psychology behind, behind surviving a natural disaster is Rose Essex with the Nebraska Psych Psychological Association. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you for covering this. You know, we were just talking about uh, the difference between um, helping someone during a natural disaster, whether it's a tornado or a flood. And, and you mentioned a really interesting point that uh, after a flood, you know, it, it's not over. Oftentimes mm -hmm. it, it can keep coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there can, the water rises and then it goes back down and it rises again. So it just, and to be in that state of chronic stress for a long period of time is just hard to take. For people who are struggling with this right now, you know, maybe, maybe people who have lost their homes or have just seen the damage, do you have any advice for them on how they can move forward from here? Well, and of course, part of the problem with what we have going on now is it's not necessarily completely over. So mm -hmm. there's the there's the techniques that you use while it's still going on, and then there's the techniques that you use to try to heal once it's over. Uh, when we're under stress, we can get into bad habits, 
um, you know, not prioritizing sleep, going for the comfort foods, getting out of our regular routine. Uh, routines can be reinforcing, they can make things feel normal. So to try to remind people to, you know, use their good health habits to try to get regular meals because when you're under stress, mm -hmm. often you're not hungry, but your body needs food, you know, needs fuel more than anything. So yeah, so while you're in the acute phase, you know, try to keep uh, keep the good health habits, try to keep some things that, that you enjoy, take some time for things that you enjoy, and try to limit some of your cover, some of your exposure to some of the more traumatic parts of it, take a break from time to time. And you're trained to respond to natural disasters. You said that you were actually in New Jersey responding mm -hmm. to 9-11. What, what does your job entail when, when you get out there? Well, in uh, disaster mental health, of course, first you have to make sure people's basic needs are met. Um, so, you know, making sure people have housing, people have food, and then a lot of it is just, it's what we call it psychological first aid. It's the checking in with people on, you know, are you taking care of yourself? How are your kids doing? Uh, are you able to take care of them too? Um, and people want to talk. Often that, you know, when I was out in New York, everybody wanted to tell their story. It's just like it's a part of processing it to try to put it into words. But then at the same time, we're keeping an eye out for, all right, when do you need more help yes. than just are you sleeping and do you need to talk and try to help set people up with the resources that they need. So how do you determine that versus what's what's normal versus when, when you need a little extra help, maybe see a therapist? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's when it's useful to know what's normal because mm -hmm. when you're under acute stress, a lot of stuff is actually normal. You right. know, like having trouble sleeping, having disturbing dreams, uh, emotional outbursts, uh, kind of going back to behaviors that you thought you'd outgrown, you know, teenage kids wanting to sleep with their parents, kids who are maybe uh, school age starting to wet the bed again. If you recognize what that is, then you kind of know how to respond to it. But when people are really kind of chronically not functioning, when you're, you know, chronically not able to sleep when you're not going into work in the morning. Certainly if you're having any thoughts of hurting yourself, if you feel out of control, you know, when the anger becomes not just letting off steam, but, but actually dangerous, then that's when it's time to, to seek help. And many groups are offering support and supplies to those in need of the flooding aftermath. And one of the largest organizations helping is the American Red Cross. I talked to a representative on how you can get help from them and what they are doing to aid in the recovery. Well, as those devastating floods have hit many of our viewing area and beyond, one organization that's been on the ground nonstop offering relief and support is the Red Cross. Joining me now is Wayson Dunn, lead volunteer for the local chapter of the American Red Cross, to talk about their efforts and how more people can get involved in helping those affected. Good morning, Wayson. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Um, so I know that you guys, you've been out in the field and kind of working quite a bit. From the perspective of the Red Cross, can you tell me some of the devastation that you guys have seen? Well, the damage and the losses of the people affected have, have really been heartbreaking. Uh, we did an aerial damage assessment survey before we could even get access to some of these sites. And to see the amount of water, to see the number of homes affected was really quite emotional. Uh, also, uh, I had the, the privilege of talking to a number of people that were affected who were staying in our shelters and seeking uh, comfort and refuge with us. And uh, the amount of loss, the suddenness of it, um, just the whole emotional impact has been very severe. You know, and again, this was so unexpected and it hit so widespread, two states. How quickly did the Red Cross have to assemble to be able to provide shelter and basic necessities for a lot of these people impacted? Well, the Red Cross has a great deal of experience responding to these sorts of things, mm -hmm. but it is definitely a challenge. Um, we had to scramble initially to respond with just our local staff and local volunteers uh, and then start the process of bringing in reinforcements really from throughout the country. Uh, right now, as we speak, we have approximately 250 volunteers and staff from all around the country working. We've also had to bring in massive amounts of supplies, uh, vehicles, equipment, uh, communications equipment and the like. It, it's almost like orchestrating a military operation. I, I can imagine. What do you need still the most of? I mean, this is going to be an ongoing effort for, for months to help these people recover. What do you need the most of from, from viewers if they can donate? Well, the best way to help right now is really three different things. 
first and foremost, uh, financial donations are always needed and always the best because those can be used to acquire whatever resources we need, whether it's equipment, uh, supplies for people, food, and the like. So to donate, uh, people can uh, go through a number of different channels. Uh, one is to donate online by going to redcross.org slash donate and select disaster relief. You can all also call 1-800-RED-CROSS uh, to donate by phone or if you want to do a quick $10 text donation, you text Red Cross to 90999. We also need volunteers because, as I said, we have a, we've brought in a lot of people. We have a lot of local staff that have been working virtually nonstop since mm -hmm. the flooding started a couple of weeks ago. People who are interested in volunteering should go to uh, 1-800-RED-CROSS.ORG and apply to be a volunteer. So uh, we can really help out in a number of ways. And the other thing that many people don't think about is we have a continuing need for blood donations. Mm -hmm. We have had scores of blood drives that were canceled as a result of mm -hmm. the flooding. So uh, blood donations are always something that are needed. Well, many people are here to help. Unfortunately, some people are here to scam. Yeah, I sat down with a local law enforcement official who talked about ways to make sure you're not taken advantage of. When the flooding hits us, hit us, we watch thousands of people come together to help. But unfortunately, while many people go above and beyond to take care of their communities, some take advantage of the people who need the help the most. So joining us now to talk about what scammers try to do after a flood is investigator Matt Bur uh, Burrell with the Sarpy County Sheriff's Office. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. You know, we were talking earlier, uh, originally I th was just thinking of, you know, nonprofit scams, you know, people trying to collect donations, but you said it's, it's people really who are preying on the victims. Well, the contractor fraud is always on the rise, but after a natural disaster, you see even more of it. What, what can you do to make sure that you don't get scammed? Well, number one, you want to ask a lot of questions. And if you feel like your questions aren't being answered, you need to take pause and think, is this the person that's right for me? And you mentioned, you know, that you're seeing all these people from out of state coming into the communities. What, what's going on with all of that? Well, that's particularly troublesome. So in Sarpy County particularly, we still have zones that are flood zones that you're not allowed entrance to unless you're a resident. Well, we've got contractors from out of state that are coming in trying to make contact with those people. And a lot of them employ really high pressure tactics. And those are the ones that we really want to watch out for. So when you say high pressure tactics, what are they doing? Well, a lot of times it's, hey, if you sign up with me now, I can give you this deal. Or I can only help you because I've got a huge list of people waiting. And it's that pressure that they're preying on people's desperation. So typically, people aren't going to offer a limited time only in, in these situations if it's a reputable business. Absolutely not. Absol they, okay. they would be... You know, sometimes even you're in line and the busy people are going to say, hey, I will get to you, I promise, but it's going to take a little bit of time. It is so disappointing to hear about this with, with people who need the help the most to, to be preyed on like this. Is there anything else that people should watch out for? Well, you also want to pay special attention to exactly what they are doing. Um, make sure that they're licensed. You know, in the state of Nebraska, you have to be a licensed contractor for electrical and for plumbing and for mechanical work. So make sure you verify their credentials. And there's also some resources for people to use to, to look up if someone's credible. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, I'm a firm believer in the Better Business Bureau. Mm -hmm. um, look at their rating. You know, look at Google reviews and, and really look at your local companies. Look at the companies that have been around for a long time. Yeah, it's really important to have those brick and mortar businesses where you're able to have an actual address. And I think you also mentioned in your press release, you know, if someone says that they're a part of a company to call that company. For sure. Um, call the company, verify who they are because credentials can be counterfeited. Mm -hmm. um, they can say who they are and with nothing else to verify them, you're really running a risk to get scammed. All right. And when natural disasters hit, one federal agency is at the forefront of providing everything from money to housing for those who were hit the hardest. I talked to an official from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, on how you can turn to the federal government for help. Well, Daryl Habish, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, first and foremost, you've been here how long now, you personally? 
Oh, I, I came here on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a quick turnaround. We're bringing people in from all across the United States. Uh, many are still arriving here in Nebraska. This is a large, especially a geographic mm -hmm. uh, type of disaster. What what's some of the, the uh, I know you've been in Valley, for example, what's kind of mm -hmm. some of the devastation that you've been seeing? You know, this type of flooding is just so widespread mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's almost insidious because even if you're just a little bit affected, mm -hmm. that means it's a lot. Mm -hmm. Mold is going to be growing yeah. uh, incessantly here very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the amount of uh, water that has been everywhere has just devastated communities. Mm -hmm. We're in the process right now of opening up disaster recovery centers uh, around Nebraska and in these affected areas. So uh, we hope everyone pays attention uh, to the news mm -hmm. and finding out where these disaster recovery centers will be open. Uh, right now we have one in Valley that's mm -hmm. open and also in Bellevue that will be open mm -hmm. on Saturday morning. They will be open uh, seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Folks can register there mm -hmm. uh, for FEMA assistance, which is grant money mm -hmm. and does not have to be paid back. So it's to help survivors get over that initial shock mm -hmm. when they, they need assistance right, right now. Yeah, and what kind of um, services, or, or like you said, I know aid, but is there anything specific that people should know as far as you need to have X, Y, Z in order to qualify or documents they need to take in, anything of that sort? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. The very first thing people need to do is make their insurance claim. That's their first line of defense mm -hmm. and the first step towards recovery. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're underinsured or uh, not insured at all, by all means come forward and register with FEMA. Mm -hmm. They can do it at 800-621-3362 mm -hmm. or they can go online at disasterassistance.gov or in the disaster recovery agents or uh, centers. Mm -hmm. They need to have the same information like they're making an insurance claim. Uh, so they need to have their uh, description of damages, mm -hmm. where the damage occurred, where they're staying today. We need to be able to contact them mm -hmm. and keep them updated about the process of their application. Uh, also their social security number, or at least one individual within that household that has a mm -hmm. social security number. Then the entire household will be eligible. Uh, so there's a lot of that type of uh, specific information financial information, your routing number, your account numbers, we'll only ask for that once. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, you will be given a registration number. FEMA will always refer to that registration number. Mm -hmm. If people say they're from FEMA and they want that personal information again later on, mm -hmm. it's not us. Gotcha, okay. And the good thing is that you'll be in town for a while to be able to assist with this. We will be here as long as it takes. Thanks for joining us. We hope this information will help you get through the long road to recovery. We have a complete list of resources for individuals and businesses to help in recovering. It'll all be on our website, 3newsnow.com.